Here's your next game, see? Thanks. Have fun with it, see? Hey, how's it? Yeah. Uh. It's time to review Starbound. Now, I'll say from the outset that while I don't have a great deal of experience with this title, I do have a worryingly large amount of experience with very similar titles of Terraria, Minecraft, and very recently, Ark Survival Evolved. So, I think it's inevitable that I'm going to be drawing a lot of conclusions. But I guess I should also explain why, if I've spent so many hours in those games, you haven't seen a proper review of them. Story. And a purpose and a point. That's something I care about in my games and in my reviews, and... They don't have one of those. Starbound, however, includes a lore and a real story, so I was pretty excited going into this game. And I will say from the outset, there's a lot it does really well. The lore is interesting, the random books are well written, the pre-generated structures are something I desperately want in the other games that I mentioned. Finding a structure is fun and interesting at first, and helps the planet to feel more alive. The dungeons can actually be intricate with traps and challenges, and finding a random challenge door underground always lights up the mood with excitement. The space theming is a creative and an interesting concept. Your ability to theme the things you build is stronger than in any of the other games. The planets and art style are very pretty, and the enemies are wonderfully adorable. Oh god, get it off! Oh no, no! I front load my compliments because longtime viewers of the channel will know that I can have enjoyed or at least had some fun with a game and still deeply criticize it. And while I found Starbound to be interesting and have some good ideas and some creativity, it lacks cohesion and quality. Then again, what should I expect of something that was mostly created by unpaid teenage interns Chucklefish was too busy exploiting to do anything else? I can't help but bring that up, when while I don't doubt the passion of those, uh, <clears throat> volunteers, the final product definitely shows the cracks if looked at with a critical eye. Of course there's the little things, like how absolutely nothing is explained. If you're considering going into Starbound for the first time blind and are going to play it on your own or with other new players, do not touch it. If you don't have someone else there to explain the obvious things you're missing and to go over things with you, you're not going to have a good time. I've had this complaint once before when I said I shouldn't have to read a wiki to play and understand Final Fantasy Tactics. But once I did know what was going on in that game, it turned into a strategical joy to play with a wonderful story. Once you understand Starbound, it's a mediocre crafting Skinner box with too much promise and an awful excuse for a story. Now I'm aware that's a lot to drop so suddenly, but I couldn't hold it back any longer. Another seemingly minor thing is the lag. No game has any right to lag this badly on single player. It's not overtaxing my computer. I watched the task manager while it ran. It's not online, so it shouldn't have latency issues. And even if task manager wasn't showing me the strain on my computer, the excuse given to me by fans during my stream of, it's just rendering so many individual bricks, doesn't even slightly fly. You're suggesting to me that this game is rendering more bricks and creatures than my high distance render Minecraft game? That it's rendering more than a large Terraria world? That it's rendering more than the entire Ark base island with all individual moving creatures and grasses? No, it's obviously not. So why does it have more lag than some of my League of Legends games? You'll get into combat with a single enemy and the entire screen can freeze for a moment when there's nothing else running on my whole computer. Thank you, I deeply wanted to get hit. Not to worry though, because you're going to get hit. Starbound's combat is easily the worst among the four games I'm comparing. On the surface, it's just a ripoff of Terraria with guns, but in reality, it's something I'm even more familiar with. You engage in combat one of three ways. 
One, you run wildly away from the enemy, firing behind you until your energy runs out. Then you keep running, and you fire more when it comes back. If the enemy dies before getting to you, you win. If it reaches you, or if it had a gun too, see number three. Number two, you hide somewhere the enemy can't get into or where the AI just sort of ignores it's being killed because it can't see to engage in combat. Use a wand or a guided rocket to shoot them from this safety until they're gone. Three, engage in a slap fight. The slapping may be with bullets. It may be with swords. But the rules stay the same. Pray they die before you do. If they don't, swap to your healing item before dying. Don't do it too late though because there will be a delay after swapping before you can use that item. Heal. Swap back to your weapon with the same delay. Resume slapping. Repeat until one of you dies. Well, I changed my mind. I'm gonna do it now. <laughs> but I'm sure the core argument is, you're not here to fight things, you're here to explore. So let's explore. The storyline wants you to find different races in order to scan their stuff. Why? So that when you've scanned enough, you can go to a boss fight. Why? So you can get an artifact. Why? So you can combine all the artifacts to go to a planet and fight the final boss. Why? Because it'll destroy the universe if you don't. Standard protagonist plot 12C. Let's start it on the complaints with everything else, then. Uh, let's start with the mech. Yeah, we have a mech! And at first, that seems really cool. Until you ask... Why? So you can go into space and visit other ships. Why? So you can find parts to upgrade your mech. Why? So you can go into space and visit other ships. That's it! The mech is worthless. The other ships, worthless. The only reason to interact with any of it is for the sake of doing it. You had such a creative idea. Implement it meaningfully into your game. And I'm not done. You can recruit crew members. Why? Well, they'll come to your ship. Every two, you'll be able to upgrade your ship and get more space. Yeah, actually useful, right? Well, no. You only need four before your ship is big enough that everything that matters can fit on it. If you don't include beds like I did, one upgrade at two would be enough. Being a part of your crew also seems to come with a mandatory lobotomy. Sure about this, see? Yeah, just jam it in already. Maybe then this will make sense. I'm not sure, see? They do no meaningful damage. They run ahead of you directly into acid and lava. They barely know how to use their weapons, even if those weapons actually did any damage. The only thing they're good at is closing doors you were about to walk through. The crew members are another amazing example of what's wrong with this game. All the creativity of an ocean and the depth of a kiddie pool. Why can't we upgrade the weapons and the armor our crew wears to make them actually be useful? Why can't we take the cosmetics that you're constantly foisting on me to wear and put them on the crew? Instead, I'll only ever get to see whatever cosmetic gear I've chosen to put on myself and whatever outfit the monkey managed to dress himself in. How meaningless when by the end of the game, my looting had gotten me boxes and boxes of cosmetic items. Sure, some were really neat, but I can only wear one set. And the Lava Lord is displeased with these paltry offerings. Of course, instead of the crew helping you, random monsters you capture in the world can help you. You weaken them, throw a small ball at them, and hopefully it turns them into your eternal servants to battle their kind. This is neat, and it can actually help you in fights. That's more how you do it. Implement an idea that actually has some effect on the game beyond furthering itself. But that's the only cool moment of creativity implemented this way. Your breathing apparatus has a lot of cool upgrades that can be placed on it, but only one can ever be put on it this way at a time. And if you ever want to go underground, you need the light upgrade. You could always just wear a portable light instead of the breathing box, but lots of the more difficult planets just kill you if you're not wearing the device. In fact, even if you are wearing it, there are fun planets with things like acid rain on the surface. Neat idea. In practice, that's just, nah, you're not allowed to play right now. Go to a different planet. Ooh, what an interesting interactive experience. Once again, there were creative ideas, but they weren't implemented in any way that works in harmony with your core concepts and gameplay. And then of course, you can make a colony. What? No, do not even ask why, I genuinely don't know. It would appear you can spend a lot of your time and resources to make a colony 
that is yours on an undiscovered dish planet that will then uh, give you their resources. Spot of tea, old chap. Why do I suddenly have inexplicable thoughts of Englishmen and bananas? Staying on topic, your people will give you resources. But never, from what I can tell, resources that you couldn't gather by spending an hour or two on the planet. Or 20 minutes on a planet. You know, the resources that are supposedly the whole purpose of this game. Since space and mechs are meaningless and the combat's for knuckleheads. But don't worry, exploring the planet is pretty mediocre at best, too. You touch down on a planet. The random generation is absolutely beautiful. The first time or two. But you're encouraged to explore planet after planet after planet after planet. And every planet of the same type looks so similar that you really start to wonder if you've already been there. It gets stale as everything looks the same and is meaningless. Look! I found a town. There might be some quests here that'll give me a little reward bag, and if you do a whole quest chain, you might earn an ally. Oh, but only if it's a town of the main races. If it's a town made up of toads, llamas, or homestuck trolls, it's just sort of an extra thing getting in your way as you run around the planet trying to find the town or dungeon you need to scan for the story quest. Even if you wanted to explore for just the joy of seeing another of the exact same pre-generated structure you've already explored seven or eight times already, what are you going to find? Probably the exact same costume piece you already had and some more meaningless money. There's nothing worth buying that an hour or two of work couldn't obtain just as fast. You're probably not going to find a new weapon you want, and the upgrade chips have a 1 in 3 chance of actually being something you want. And yet, the game seems to think that these chips are the perfect reward for everything. If you get an upgrade for the matter manipulator, Excellent. You're going to need roughly enough of those to suffocate a Clydesdale, and you'll constantly be using your manipulator. However, the other two upgrades are of increasing uselessness. Firstly, they're ship upgrades. If you don't remember, rewind this video a few minutes and you'll be able to remember exactly how much upgrading your ship matters. Even if you wanted an upgraded ship, you'd have to complete missions to recruit random crew members first, making it even more worthless, but we'll come back to that point, because we'll have to have a look at the third option of reward first, the tech upgrades. On the surface, these seem amazing. They can change your special abilities, a double jump, dashing, a blink, the ball clinging to walls, triple jumps, and each can be unlocked with eight chips, so you must need a lot of them. Except you don't. You need 16. You'll be given the double jump automatically. The others aren't upgrades, they're trade-offs. You can have the double jump or the triple jump. Your ball could roll fast or it can roll up walls. You can dash or you can blink. But Otter, why would you want a double jump over a triple jump? Well, that would be because one is a double jump and the other is a triple hop that couldn't clear your average fence. Sure, a blink would be neat, but you have to double tap to activate the ability, and it's a fickle mistress, just as likely to move you forwards in two half steps as to activate your dash or blink. Plus, when I bring up another point in a bit, you'll desperately want a dash. Except when you don't, because you can't use multiple abilities at once. If you're in a ball, you can forget about leaving ball form and jumping. If you're dashing, you better not need that double jump for anything. These are, once again, Really great ideas that all feel completely detached from each other. Even if you disagree with me on which three abilities are the best combination, you would still only need 24 of the upgrade chips at most to unlock them, and then you will never again need another chip, but the game will keep showering you in them. Yet another incentive not to waste your time exploring. Now let's take a step back to the missions. If you're lucky, they'll go like this. Hello there. Hey, I want to be friends with this guy, see? And I hear the best way to be friends is to talk to each other, yeah? Bring him this note for me, see? Uh, sure. Here, that guy said to give it to you. Hey, thanks, see? Real nice of ya. Bring him this note back, will ya? Sure. Here you go. Thanks, see? Hey, I really do need eight iron ore. Uh, seeing as I've opened, you know, the last few chests on my way here, I've got like 20 iron ore. It's nearly as common as dirt. Just need to make sure you had it. 
Hey, could you turn it into iron bars for me? See? Well, that would require going back to my ship, then me back down to the planet, and walking for 12 minutes around your boring as cruel planet again to get here. Would these four I made earlier work? Oh, good. Glad to see I made him into bars for me. Do a gangster a solid and bring to that guy from earlier for me. See? Uh, sure. He asked me to give this to you? Ha, huh, yeah, the order. Hello? Uh, he hello? There you go. <laughs> Bring this on back to him, see? Sure, see. Hey, that's our word, see? Here, it's done. Hey, thanks. I feel so much cooler now. Yeah, cooler than the dawn. Man, I sure do feel enriched for having done all of that. Now let's see what a mission's more likely to be, shall we? Hello there. Hey, my friend is in danger, see? Oh, sounds rough. If you were really a part of the family, you'd be there to help the family when they need it. Go make sure he's safe, see? Hello there. There's some weird people over there, see? And? Swimming with the fishes. Can do. Hello. Hey, I need five iron ingots, see? Oh, well, I've got like 27 in my back. Nah, nah, nah I need five help. specific see? iron ingots, see? There was stolen from me by a fox earlier. Just follow the arrow, see? You probably think I've exaggerated in this little skit, but no, I haven't. Not even in the area you probably think I was. That's right. I have the guts to say it. The foxes really are that cute. Oh, and walking's even more boring. That's possibly the worst part of everything in Starbound to me. No other game in this genre makes the mistake of Starbound. Of course every exploration game has this issue. Wandering in Minecraft is either soul-crushingly boring in the daytime or pants-wettingly lethal at night. Traveling the map in Terraria just to get out to somewhere that you died before your stuff despawns is a tedium only penetrated by the soul-searing self-hatred of failure. Flying across the island in Ark to bring back some obsidian to your base is an exercise in tedium only broken by the terror of running into a gigantosaurus while flying a bit too low or a sudden Sarko attack while letting your Argentavis regain its energy because you refuse to stop sprinting. When the size of the world is part of the exploratory selling point, this is somewhat inevitable. But in none of these games is the aforementioned tedium the main gameplay mechanic. The core idea of Starbound is to touch down on a planet, wander that planet to see what you can find on it without a purpose or direction because you just need to explore. 
Once you've circled the entire planet, go up to your ship, pick a new planet that looks exactly the same as the planet you've already been on two to three other times at least, and do it again. If you're actually on level for the planet you're circling, this frustration is doubled as you will eventually die. Might be because you lost the slap fight. Could be a lag spike prevented you from double jumping so you didn't hit the ground quite so hard. Maybe that lag spike stopped you from healing in the slap fight. Maybe just swapping to your healing item but the delay didn't let it go off was what did it. It doesn't matter how you died because at some point your life will end and 30% of your money will be taken away. Oh no, what would I do without that? And all your non-weapon upgrade on cosmetic items will be left where you died. My what? Your crafting materials you spent the last 30 hours collecting. Oh, uh, hang on, before you go back down there, one more thing. Your healing items were dropped too. But if I died on my way here, now I have to go back without taking damage? Can't be that hard, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Let me just check the weather real quick. Yeah, that's what I thought. It's still raining fire. It's always raining fire on this planet. Well, you can just craft some basic crappy health kits with vines, right? You took my crafting inventory. Well, that's your fault for not having left some healing items behind for yourself and not setting up a colony you could exploit, I mean, that could assist you. Hello, I am the Englishman who went up a hill and came down with all the bananas, leaving, of course, the inhabitants of the hill with no bananas and therefore bestowing the term selfish upon myself. Yes, no, selfish! I know, but I've got all the bananas! Once you've finally gone back to where you left your stuff, after minutes and minutes of walking through exactly the same things you already saw before just to get there again, you can once again resume circling the planet. This is also why I complain about how boring and obnoxious the pre-generated structures are, despite also praising how cool they were earlier. I strongly hold to what I said at the start of this. I would love it if the other three games would implement these kinds of things. Finding a toad village in Terraria or a special robot dungeon in Minecraft that actually had challenges and rewards, looking very judgingly at you, Woodland Mansion, would be incredible. But in those games, you aren't likely to see the same things over and 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 over in one playthrough of the game until they become vastly overused. If that much effort is going in, you would think it means something. But finding a toad village in Stardew Valley doesn't even hold the significance of finding a desert well in Minecraft. At least those are rare, even if they are meaningless. By the time you've even finished playing story mode, you'll have seen enough toads in the universe that it couldn't possibly have enough princesses for them all. If Terraria or Minecraft had awesome dungeons like Starbound, you would interact with them once per map. Finding them would feel special, it'd be a challenge to overcome. The traps would probably be raised up a step or two as well, but in Starbound, they're just another eternal feature. They'll have some enemies that are on level for the planet, whether that be dangerous to you or one-shot kill, and some traps that are easy to overcome because if it was more complicated, it couldn't be on a million planets. The structures only really start coming alive in the special story maps, becoming something unique. You can't wait to see what comes next. You will never hear me complain about those dungeons, other than a bit of small complaints like coding for the last area of the Big 8 boss. When you die to the boss, the general monkey resets, playing the animations and lines for when you first started the map, and the door forwards can only be opened when the door to outside is open, but the very polite and poorly coded NPCs keep closing it before you can go up. But those are small, overall meaningless quibbles. If the whole game had this detail and unified creativity, then I would be praising it with every paragraph, but instead, you will quickly realize that nothing is special. It's not even worth going into dungeons most of the time because there is nothing waiting for you other than some enemies that will either be obnoxious slap fights or boring obstacles to just breeze through. Also, you can get two to three chests that probably contain a weapon weaker than something you could already find, wandering in a village, or most likely another costume piece you already had. So now you're 30 plus hours or so into the game. You've realized the dungeons don't matter, you've realized the villages and other missions aren't worth it, the mech doesn't need to be touched, and you aren't wasting your time on colonization. You're just walking around another planet. The first time when you're seeing new things, it was so cool, but now you've seen all the planets there are to see and everything looks exactly the same planet to planet. What is there for you to do? Make something that looks cool. Okay, neat. Why? 
Ah, that's back. Well, for no other purpose than to make something that looks cool. Let me pull out the comparisons again. When I upgrade my base in Ark, it can make it safer from wild dino attacks. If I'm on a PvP server, other people will not only see it as they build their bases on the same island, but might even try to attack it. In Minecraft, my home is a base point, and most people who are trying to make something that looks cool are indeed doing it for its own sake, but with the 3D nature of the game meaning you can get builds that look amazing and can actually be explored. The 2D nature of Starbound restricts it. On top of that, Minecraft has redstone. You can make a build that does something, that is interactable. In Starbound, you can, uh, open and close a door, I guess? Maybe you can build an underwater airlock or a pre-made rail track? That's about as interactive as it gets. Building in Starbound is essentially most analogous to building in Terraria. But building a house in Terraria involves making a house and a place for real, live-feeling NPCs to live. NPCs that are actually useful and sell you things you genuinely need to progress. They can heal you mid-battle. They can give or trade you for items that you have no other way to get. That can explain the game to you. Your house can be built in such a way as to help you with certain boss fights. And you'll be called on to defend it when the goblin army attacks. In Starbound, it looks pretty. Your actions have no impact on the core gameplay loop. It is once again, something you can do for the sake of doing it. Yes, others can come to see what you've made in multiplayer. Very cool. What are they supposed to do in the world? Travel from planet to planet in the same endless tedium for the sake of itself? So instead, you head to the only thing of any meaning. The story end of the game. And all of that scanning, all of those awesome boss dungeons, all of that leads to a completely unique planet. Oh, but before you head out, hope you held on to your awful starting weapon. Yeah, remember the broken sword you got in the first five minutes of the game? You can get that upgraded now into the final strongest sword. It might be understandable if you held on to that sword for the first hour. But even after the first half hour, you've seen that every weapon is replaced as you find something stronger. Why would you hold on to any other gun or weapon in the game when they cannot be upgraded into something else? You don't need them to craft something new. You just replace them with the upgrade and sell the old one. But here, at the end of the game, a few select weapons can now be upgraded or are needed to craft more powerful weapons. Oh yeah, those old things? Yeah, I sold them hours ago because that's what you do. I have not seen an implementation of an ultimate final weapon more stupid than this since Final Fantasy. Fantasy 12. Whatever, it's not like it does much more damage than the sword I've already got. At the center of this planet lies the final boss, an enormous eyeball that summons random enemies from other planets. This is some kind of world ender? I lost to it several times thanks to lag spikes that made me question if I was secretly playing this game on Google Stadia, and the pause before you can use your healing items before finally overcoming the boss. And then the game throws any kind of care out the window. You die. The planet blows up. You can't escape and you die. You see the other named NPCs you interacted with in each special story dungeon looking kinda sad. And then a mysterious voice tells you it's very sorry you died, and that it died too, but it was actually alive in spirit watching you. Were you killed? Sadly, yes. But I live. So now it's going to use the last of its apparently immense power to bring you back to life. And the game promptly dumps you back among your kinda glum looking allies. Except it'd be more programming than the exploited teenagers Chucklefish uses to be capable of to actually show your character beam down in their custom cutscene. So instead you just see your glowing yellow generic teleport form in the credits roll. You were dead less than five minutes. It's treated with all the serious mood of layers of fear while you're dead, yet it carried less meaning than Superman dying when you're happy back and posing back in your costume for a special ending postcard in less time than it takes to brew a cup of tea. Sure you won't join me for a cup, see? Uh, what have I got to lose? Ugh. So why'd we go with this whole mobster theme anyway? Oh, I thought it seemed cool. Yeah, but I feel like we could have put all this effort into literally anything else that would have actually helped with the review and not almost given me heat stroke. Oh, did you think I wasn't going to bring up the bounties? Instead of actually 
working on his game so that he doesn't run like a paraplegic or implementing something that actually matters to the gameplay or giving it a point or doing anything that unifies the game elements. No, instead he went with the kind of reckless implement another thing that seems cool to me attitude that I would expect out of Yandere Dev. A Hawaii Five-0 style cop has survived the destruction of the Earth's peacekeepers and has set up a bounty board where you can accept new missions. The basic short missions are just flying to the planet. Beam down, wander aimlessly until your compass decides it likes where you've wandered to. It'll now point to the target you're here to fight. Go halfway around the planet to fight them, get in a fight. Beam back up, fly to your ship to your next bounty. But some missions are special and actually progress your bounty hunting rank. Here's how those ones play out. Good choice, he'll be a tough one, I'm sure. Just head on out to the right star system and be on your way. Hey Gads, those fiends must be on this planet. Good work, Gumshoe. Head over there. Ha, of course, we're getting warmer on the real target, partner. Head over to the next planet. Hey, 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 whoa, I'm in your side, see? The guy's over on Rusharam 5. What a helpful guy. Better head over there.
That fiendish rogue, how could he act so helpful? Get back over there and apprehend him. Post haste. You fool! It was me, Dio, the entire time! Excellent job, partner. He won't be running any mafias where he's going. Come on back to the board and get your reward. I hadn't even noticed before now. Well, I noticed, but not much. How long and pointless the space travel was. Yeah, it's nice, it's thematic, and it's it's a bit like real space travel. Except that I don't get to press buttons or interact. Nothing can happen while I'm traveling. This is an Artemis spaceship simulator or Elite Dangerous. You just fly and a screen behind your ship plays. It's frustrating just sitting there inactive waiting for 30 seconds or so, but it's tolerable until the missions devolve into go to this planet for 67 seconds. Now spend half as much time in space. Now go to the next planet. Oh, you got your info and have been here 20 seconds. Now spend another 30 going somewhere else. I'm hard pressed to say what's more frustrating. That constant beam up travel beam down when you're spending more time in space waiting to be allowed to play or when you're just wandering around a planet towards a compass point for several minutes waiting to have another slap fight so you can get off the planet. And because they're organized by how difficult the planets are, they're all the same planet. If you weren't sick of seeing the same planet over and over, just wait until you visit seven different stars and realize that every planet circling them is made up of the exact same things. If you suffer enough to get through all of that, you get another unique dungeon. And that's great. Now, if it was just worth the time it took to get to that point, I wouldn't be complaining. Supposedly, the final bounty is really neat. Cool. Why should I care? All of this to slowly be moved to upgraded stations. There seems to be a special shop your fun bucks could be used at, but you have to make it pretty far to have anything worth buying at the rate things were progressing. Look, Starbound isn't bad. I know I've been sitting here ripping it into one, but that's because it had so much potential. It had so much that it almost did right. I want to love this beautiful and creative game and there's nothing here worth doing. You can have fun with Starbound. You could sit down and just have a few mindless hours interacting and turning off your brain for just the sake of doing it. At its core, Starbound is just an over-elaborate Skinner box. For those of you not aware, there's a concept in psychology based around operant conditioning. The idea is that if you are rewarded for something, you'll keep doing it. But the thing is more likely to be done and repeated if you are given a reward at random. Usually in the original box, a rat would press a lever and be given food. But if it was always given food, it stopped pressing the lever or button. Instead, the lever or button would randomly dispense food, getting the rat hooked to pressing it, staying engaged. Slot machines work off of the same idea. The flashing lights, the pretty sounds and colors and graphics are just engaging enough to keep your mind focused, so you keep pulling that lever. The random payout gives your brain the dopamine rush it wants, so even if the payout keeps losing you money, you keep on going with that sweet, sweet... You trudge through the tedium of walking around a planet, all for the small hit of finding something. An avian skyship, neat, haven't seen one of those in hours. Found my second glitch village, it doesn't do anything useful, but I found it. Oh, a new upgrade chip, I just need 31 more, and I can go to 300% mining speed. Beam down to another planet, pull that lever. Just another few dollars of your time sunk in, and you'll get a big payout, like a new gun but you can never get anything that makes your money back because there's nothing that substantial here. 
And yes, I can turn off my brain and enjoy a few hours of Starbound if I'm willing to not think about it and not be critical. It feels the same to me as digging my Minecraft hole. But I made up my own rules for the hole one random Monday in between my college classes. And it has no larger purpose than to dig it for the sake of digging it. Starbound came with its own rules that someone programmed into it. And someone spent hours and hours and days of their life creating it. All for the same level of engaging gameplay. So I guess the real question is... Does that say something about Starbound? Or does it say something about my hole? I don't think I'm gonna answer that. Hey guys, holy crap, you made it to the end of this one. Yeah, it was a pretty super long, super insane one, I know. Next one should be a lot shorter, a lot more compact. The amount of support I've been receiving on the stream with the Subnautica and the new games I'm playing, currently doing Kingdom Hearts, if you're watching this as it comes out, come check it out and say hi, I'll be glad you're there. Well, until next time, thanks again for making it all the way to the end, and remember, life is always another game waiting to be discovered.